topic is S-53. You, you don't have any handout? No, I do not have any visual aids today, so I thought we'd just have a dialogue and... Oh, so I shouldn't be looking for something? No. <laughs> That's why I was checking. Thank you. All right. All right, for, for the record, Todd Moore, CEO of One Care Vermont, um, and good to see everybody. Uh, I know that you had uh, my colleague Vicki Lohner in a lot this session, and uh, hopefully that's been uh, helpful and enlightening. Uh, on this issue, I uh, assume I, I was invited because I have been involved in the discussion, especially on the Senate Health and Welfare side, and testified on uh, the topic of universal primary care. And I think I'm going to be pretty consistent with what I told them today, and then we'll, we'll get to your questions, which is, you know, clearly uh, OneCare uh, believes in the uh, relationship between a great primary care relationship with patients of all types and their best health outcomes uh, and lower spending across the entire continuum of care by good access to primary care and preventing and treating problems uh, uh, as much upstream, uh, both from a time basis and as much upstream in the healthcare delivery system in the lowest cost settings of care. Uh, we've said for years when we got to year one of all pair model that you're going to see a really uh, tangible manifestation of that as our first element of true payment reform uh, underneath the all pair model. And we have for this year, uh, you know, basically moved money from the acute care spending pie proactively into the primary care pie uh, and getting more uh, resources to primary care of all types, whether they be uh, federally qualified health centers, uh, independent practices, or hospital based practices. Practices. Uh, our most advanced model that we're piloting in three independent uh, practice organizations uh, is what we call our CPR pilot, and we you do name it that for you know the reasons that it sounds like it's CPR for independent practice. It stands for comprehensive payment reform, and what we're really trying to do is unify what is a very complex payment stream model, even for primary care doctors, into a more simplified equitable and yeah supplemented with additional resources to to make sure they can be what we what we need them to be but we are blending payment streams from medicare medicaid and commercial payers uh, certain add-on elements that we do for uh, other primary care uh, physicians and even some of the, the blueprint support that now OneCare administers into a simple once monthly capitated model across their panel of patients regardless of whether their original um, uh, uh, covering entity was Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial. And so we've had to define what is covered in this program, uh, what is a fair and equitable uh, uh, capitated model uh, that can be adjusted for different panel mixes uh, and demographic mixes and, and sickness burdens uh, of the panel. Uh, and that's what we're moving forward with. Um, it is one of the things that people most want to talk about in my travels uh, as one of our innovations. Uh, it's something that a lot uh, of people inside and outside of Vermont have talked about for a long time of, of can you move to that kind of model uh, and provide a predictable uh, and solid <coughs> revenue model for primary care to pay their doctors, pay their nurses, do good population health management, you know, take care of their space maybe even expand their capacity to take new patients because they got a good team-based model going uh, and meet a wider range of needs for, for the patients. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, you know, certainly the big, uh, one of the big goals in all pair model is to have more and more Vermonters attributed, and that's a term that's, you know, from my world, but it just means, you know, who's the ACO accountable for that we're actually trying to do these new models uh, on and take uh, accountability for, you know, affordability and high quality. Uh, and it's based on a primary care relationship. So the more primary care physicians I have in, the more payers and programs that I can uh, contract with over time will mean increasing numbers of Vermonters will be a part of this advanced payment reform model uh, for primary care that we've set course on. Um, and, you know, we take that very seriously, trying to, to spread this to, to more uh, uh, Vermonters. So, you know, a lot of ways uh, I resonate highly with a lot of the principles and uh, uh, desired outcomes uh, from universal primary care. You know, we're trying to walk the walk, uh, walk the talk a bit and, and, and jumpstart that. Um, you know, I, I do worry uh, about the complexities of, especially if you start talking about public financing, providing benefits as a right of citizenship, 
uh, does that you know open up operational issues and financial issues that you know make it harder for me to take those next steps and expand my model? Yeah, I do worry about that. Um, you know, I, I, my official position is I'm sort of agnostic on whether the time's right for Vermont to do that, uh, but I can sit here and tell you that you know one care at least believes in the tenants and is. You know, implementing things that should be highly consistent could be a chassis uh, for some of the additional reforms that I know are anticipated in, in universal primary care, such as can we make sure that nobody's out of pocket payment to see their own primary care doc is a reason why they're not going in when they ought to. Uh, I believe in that. Uh, I believe that we can work together uh, on that issue uh, uh, and, and a number of others that I, I know are important. But. Uh, that's what I wanted to start with uh, today, and you know, glad to hear any other questions or, or dialogue that you'd like to have with me on this topic today. Well, your last statement answered the question I had my, on my mind is everything you're saying about it is, is increased access, but it's not saying anything about so that one care doesn't really have any role in enabling people to use that access in terms of financial obstacles that they have. Right, nothing within your sphere controls or impacts on that. Yeah, our current set of contracts don't give us the right to set benefit models uh, or waive co-pays or deductibles that would otherwise be a part of what, what people's uh, contracts are with either Medicaid or as a Medicare uh, or Medi uh, Medicare beneficiary or as a cardholder for, for a commercial insurer. Um, I do, you know, my go-to line is, yeah, can we be a force for good in working with those payers to figure out what would it take to waive some of them um, and and make some progress on it so that we don't uh, have that be a barrier to people accessing uh, especially primary care uh, yes um, and I do hope to turn our attention to, to working on that that issue Brian I think you were, no I thought I saw you I'm, no I was, I was struggling with this chair but I didn't raise my hand <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that's, that's what caught me. <laughs> yeah. no, I've been my, my mental flinch. Um, something you had mentioned I'd like to dig in sure. a little more deeply on, because um, we've heard a couple of folks testify uh, to the effect of um, an increasing complexity of the payment stream yeah. with a publicly financed um, universal primary care model. And um, so on its face, that's a pretty simple statement. but. I'd like to understand what that actually means. And um, you know, to the effect that a universal primary care system publicly financed would affect the complexity of payment streams from one care's perspective. Would it affect it at all? Yeah, well increase let's increase it, decrease it. Yeah. And how? Let's say yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Representative Brigland. And you know, from an ACO perspective, we envision an hourglass when we talk about this, which there's payment streams that <coughs> fill in the economic sands at the top, and then the ACO can work with providers to design better payment models uh, at the bottom. And so at the top of the funnel, uh, you know, we get resources and accountability. Uh, from Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, and now we're going to pilot a University of Vermont Medical Center's uh, employee plan uh, in the top of the funnel. Now each of one of those comes with the dollars associated with primary care, um, uh, you know, and that's the source of how we can then take those sands in the top, combine them together, and pay a practice across its membership in all four of those plans. Uh, in a standard risk-adjusted capitated model with a single payment. Um, uh, so there's the payment streams up top. So if there was a universal primary care program that might carve out from one of those payers uh, the primary care dollars and create a fifth revenue stream at the top toward primary care, I guess you could say that does make our top of the funnel more complex because there's another payment stream uh, to, to account for. Um, but you know, for us, once the sands are filled up in a rational way that, uh, again, allows us to, uh, if we're going to take accountability for cost and quality, uh, work with our providers to pay them in a way that's adequate, rewards that uh, uh, performance, uh, and simplifies the bottom part of the funnel or the uh, hourglass, you know, that could be okay. Um, I'm really, when I said simplifying the payment streams, it's really the bottom part where an individual practice right now 
you know, has to collect patient out of pocket. Sometimes they got to collect the full value of the visit if somebody's within their deductible or if it's a copay model, 10 or $20 every time they see. On top of that, they send claims and wait for the money and try to count it back. Uh, from multiple payers, they get blueprint payments from Medicare, Medicaid, multiple commercial payers. They now get add-on uh, payments, uh, almost medical home style supplemental payments for their high-risk patients and their attributed patients from OneCare. OneCare is providing for a quality incentive fund uh, that the vast majority is earmarked for primary care, that they can earn that bonus at the end of the year. I'm trying to simplify that for primary care uh, across payers and really the all payer model and one care is the only way Medicare will be able to participate in that program because that's part of the waiver that we have under all payer model and through one cares uh, uh, Medicare ACO initiative where for the first time an ACO like ours can take for our in-network providers the money at the top of the hourglass in order to do multi-payer payment reform in the bottom. So we're probably the only way Medicare can even be part of something like we're talking about. Uh, and you know, the success so far of the three practices in this blended model is it's, is it's starting to really get them excited in terms of, wow, this is great, it makes sense, it's predictable, I don't have to spend as much time sort of figuring out for the attributed lives to one care, you know, am I getting these bits and pieces uh, all together because we're trying to unify those into simpler models, uh, you know, that uh, bundle it up in, in one big payment and is designed to provide again the adequate resources for them to feel good around you know we're being asked as primary care to do uh, a lot more over time without a whole lot more money this starts to feel right and that you know we can get our arms around that this is is uh, a way to test is it the right amount of resources you're paying us in the limited time that, that you've been doing this so far do you have any data that shows that um, people are, you know, people who haven't been going to a primary care physician now are, or more people are going to primary care versus the emergency room? Do you see any shifts happening yet? Well, you know, I would say we rely on, you know, now what is almost a decade worth of not just in Vermont, but sort of national evidence of the patient-centered medical home model actually working. Uh, and elements of that are really, really highly aligned with the, the ACO model. We don't get a t attribution. They don't allow us, people like Medicare and Medicaid and Blue Cross, don't want us to take accountability for a patient where we don't own an established relationship with a primary care physician. Right. Right, so that recognizes how central that is uh, to the success of the model. So uh, I, I would say the evidence from the medical home programs uh, 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 and even just plain logic is we believe in primary care uh, makes sense and you know, really part of what we're trying to do as an ACO is, is be more proactive in primary care, which is not only you know, deliver great care to the people in, in your waiting room and no matter what they're there for, you know, if there's some other things that, that you know, you've seen inform the past, check up on those and, and make sure those are all right. But try to figure out who from your panel isn't in your waiting room that maybe you might want to have in there. It's been too long since they've had an appointment right. or their risk factors through, you know, an encounter at the hospital where they might have had a diagnostic test, you know, indicate that something might be up. And so, you know, to a certain extent, you know, we're pushing the, uh, the medical homes in one care as part of getting the payment reform and the extra resources is to be more proactive and reach out, you know, where, you know, data would show that, that uh, you know, they ought to reach out and meet those patients a little bit more where they live. Henry, do you have any data on, because they go to primary care, I mean, that's a focus, that they're spending less money on more specialized visits, like cardiology, diabetes, doctor, are you finding that primary care is keeping things under control more so that they're not spending or is it too early in your model? Yeah, and so about others and what about other yeah. studies on, on that? Yeah, so, so I don't know, we have not done and I have not done anything in terms of is there a correlation for somebody who has the exact same illness burden as the exact same age and sex, if they have more primary care visits, is their total cost of care less? You know, we live in a world where their total cost of care is best predicted by how old they are and what their disease burden and, and problem list, medical problem list is, uh, and we're trying to even get further into, you know, what do we know about 
you know, any barriers to them engaging in their own health and, and, and uh, uh, you know, certain mixes of, of comorbidities uh, to try to fight through that. But, you know, I, I, would, I would have a strong hypothesis that those who are engaged in their own health care enough to call their primary care doctor or go in for regular visits, and if something isn't right, to go in and see, uh, uh, get a primary care uh, uh, dialogue going, I, I got to think that they do have lower utilization and better outcomes. Uh, but that's an assumption, not based on any. I haven't. I just personally have not seen anything that says if you see your primary care doc five or more times, if you're of this disease burden that somebody who sees their primary care doc two or fewer times yeah. has different outcomes. I just haven't seen that. That's no, but I think I was talking more about specialized visits of seeing the cardiologist. If you do see your primary care, do they keep it more under control that you're not spending money also visiting your cardiologist? People with um, multiple kind of diseases going, reaching out to specialists, are they, do you see any money saving? going out to specialists because of primary care, I think is the question. Uh, well, yeah, I think, I think certainly so. The more people will discuss with their primary care physician the, the entirety of what they think their disease burden is before they would call, even if they have the benefits to do it, call and get an appointment with a specialist. Yeah, that actually is a very good thing. And you know, certainly we use the, the term medical neighborhood when we want there to be a specialist involved in the care. Uh, so we look at it both ways. One is, yeah, we think primary care should be the quarterback of the team for the wide range of problem lists. Uh, and primary care have built capabilities over the last 10 years to you know, credibly manage the care and disease burdens of, of increasingly in, increasing number and increasing complexity of, of medical problems. Yes, but we want to do the same thing I mentioned in terms of people who don't take the initiative to call and call their primary care physician when they ought to. Uh, if there's an indication that somebody's chronic illness isn't being well managed, uh, we want the primary care doc to reach out to a specialist and say, hey, we need to work together on this patient situation. What do you think? Let's, let me take you through it. And if they agree that that patient ought to have a specialist consult as part of their care, we want to encourage that sometimes when it's not happening. So it could go either way. Right. So um, part of our discussion has been um, looking at the bill that came to this committee from the Senate and the version of the bill that left Senate Health and Welfare. Um, and I'm curious, from your perspective, what are the pros and cons of each of those bills? Um, I would say that if the state is going to pursue a universal primary care that requires a how would we define what primary care services are, how would we determine the right level and type of payment uh, to make to them, how do we actually operationalize that payment, that piece, in my mind, has to align with the ACO and all-payer model approach, that those can't go in divergent directions, okay? Now, I will say that the all-payer model is the deal that the state of Vermont and the providers agreed to, to pursue as our primary reform, uh, and I wouldn't want to do anything that slowed down our progress and success in that arena, you know, to try to keep those in alignment. Uh, so that's one thing I liked about the Senate Health and Welfare Bill, is it baked in some of that alignment by making ACOs sort of a named you know, piece of the, of the, of the leading stakeholders to, to help anticipate how we would design uh, design that. Now, I think we all realize that it's a big deal to set course for something that would contemplate public financing for a health benefit uh, and, you know, sort of tests in new ways. Can that alignment happen and would this cause a distraction uh, or a derailing of all payer model? you know, count me in and somebody who would worry about that. Uh, and so I think that's the strength of, of uh, you know, something more close to a study bill to just sort of assess what does that minefield even look like so that we don't step on, on anything by, by trying to push it harder. Well, just that um, you said the strength of the first bill was that the ACOs were involved in, in and it looks like in the second bill, it doesn't specifically name the ACOs unless I'm missing it, but it does say that the Greenmount Care Board would convene interested stakeholders. So will the ACO be an interested stakeholder? Absolutely. Um, 
so in this discussion about S53, I think it's been emphasized that um, one of the benefits is it's universal, everybody's involved. Um, in, you know, all payer, um, in the reform that we're pursuing right now, you know, I think it's important that it is rolled out quickly. So, you know, do you think um, you're on track for meeting the scale requirements of, of your model? And are you optimistic about that? Uh, I think that we just started the model. I mean, we're not even four months into right. it, and sort of one of the dialogues I would love to, to have with the legislature over time is how can we work together uh, to drive the scale scale targets and you know have the ACO model be one that you support and are proud of and you know want to want to help encourage. So uh, I, I I think we're going to need the dialogue and some help. You guys were going to need to be a part of that and. Uh, in, envision success uh, and support for the model, um, uh, but I think it's a team sport driving those scale targets. I have to say, I've been I've been personally very disappointed at the progress so far. The, the, the scope, the limited scope, um, and, and size, and we'll we'll have to see. But uh, Betsy and then Brian. So I, I'm, I'm just I'm struggling to see um, a pieces of this and mm -hmm. just don't fit. I'm sure that you would like to feel the same way. Um, but um, A, I think I would have the pyramid more than a hourglass because I see the money funneling up from primary care, not down to primary care. It needs to be started there on the base because that's where the foundation of our health care is going to be established. and. I don't see why even having Blue Cross Blue Shield and the various payers be there and we have public funding to that as well, added to that, so we increase what happens at that primary care level, the payment. I think that could drive the cost of everything down. Can you imagine how that would work? At all. I mean, just take out of your position. I, I guess I'm asking you for yeah, no, and I understand. Associate yourself from one character. Yeah, I know, no, I understand this. I understand the spirit of what you mean, the pyramid. Okay. But at the end of the day, somehow a primary care physician being responsible for a panel of patients gets money into their practice okay. to again afford the expenses of their practice, right? And so that's part of the trick of this is operationalizing it. Is is. Uh, you know, where does that money come from? Who's the agent that then transfers it? And on what basis is that transfer made? What's the right amount for an individual primary care practice uh, across its panel, for its attributed lives within its panel, or for an individual patient? Uh, those are all problems that we would be working on under a universal primary care model. And it's one of the problems that we work on every day in terms of trying to do it uh, uh, under an attributed model and, and the ACO model that gives us finally some flexibility, right? And so if traditional fee-for-service, uh, you know, it's the payer who determines how much to pay a primary care practice for each individual kernel visit, the ACO model that we're implementing under all-payer model for the first time allows us to bundle those from the payer as long as the providers are okay and sign up for this bundle those from the payer and give it to them in a way that they will, from a bottom-up perspective, say, that's a lot better, Todd. We like that a lot better than the fee-for-service system. So I, I think we're sort of on the, on the same page. And you know, it isn't so much that we go in a back room and design this and say on January 1, hey, here's how you're getting paid. Hope you like it. I mean, we have this dialogue with our primary care docs to say, how do we be a force for good? And how much more do you really need if this is what we're expecting you, you know, to do, um, uh, to be accessible and proactive and deliver high quality care and worry about, you know, what happens to your patients when they do need a specialist or end up in the hospital. Right. So, um, it's not, you know, hearing you talk about this um, issue from the perspective of, of the ACOs, it sounds like there is a, a, there is some alignment between the concept of universal primary care and what you're doing, because you were just talking about the idea of the way that you're paying primary care physicians. You're trying to design it in a way so that they can take on like sort of a caseload or a panel, yeah. um, and then be fully funded in a way that they can run their practice smoothly. And 
I think that would be the hope of universal primary care, but there are still some gaps between, there's some gaps that exist like in terms of accessibility, like you mentioned earlier, yeah. um, in terms of co-pays or deductibles being involved, being involved for some people, as well as not all insurance companies are participating in the ACO, right? So what I'm wondering is how, if, would one of these bills or something different be the best path to move from where you're at to a more universal system down the road? If it's not one, in other words, would one of these bills be the best path or is it something that we're not seeing before us? And if so, what, would, what do you think that would look like if the people of Vermont in this body decided we want a universal system, but we want to build it on what you're doing? You know, like in other words, how do we get from here to there? So the answer is if we do decide we're going to pursue this as a state, I think it's got to be aligned. And if I do get to 70% of Vermont on the scale targets, the primary care payment model for that 70% really ought to match the other 30% if we go universal, right? So that I think is a, is a first principle. I guess it really boils down to uh, almost a, a first do no harm. Uh, are we risking slowing down? really tangible good progress that we made this year, expect to make next year, um, by bringing in this whole design element all together, right? And, and, you know, is there enough change management and design bandwidth to do more than all payer model and what we're trying to do in building the scale targets of the 70%? I, I think that's a legitimate, a legitimate discussion uh, in terms of, of really do we need to put our eggs in the basket of what we signed up for as a state and use that to the greatest degree possible uh, and you know work together to get more patients in there and you know Senate Health and Welfare asked me you know could this ACO based model with your big network I mean if there were still uninsured Vermonters that we just want to figure out how to get them access to primary care even if we can't fund hospital insurance for them you know can your network work on that I think the network would be interested in working on that I know you're going to talk to Georgia Meharis uh, on behalf of FQHCs, who that's really their role in every healthcare system where they exist, is you can walk up to the front door of any FQHC today and you're going to get seen uh, and be able to establish a relationship. So we have some good building blocks here in Vermont to really, really make some progress on this uh, working together. You know, raising the specter of you know, public financing and a benefit of the right of citizenship and you know, all the political ballast that's going to bring in and sort of the stakeholders are going to, going to want to be in the room and you're right, I'm going to want to be in there, have people in there really to participate and it's going to take me off from how can I make more progress next year. I'm not going to lie, I really do worry about that and, and I'd prefer to take one more step and you know, maybe, maybe live to talk about this another day on how we can maybe go beyond 70% in the scale targets if we can get some momentum. Betsy? So, um, although this is the first year of the, of the I'll pay Last year we had the pilot year. Mm -hmm. I'll pay and if we were your board of trustees, what were you, what would you say are your successes from this? Well, it's almost a full year from when it's a little more than a full year from when you started last year. At this point, what would you say are the successes that you've seen? Yeah, that that the full continuum of care and different types of primary care and different types of hospitals working together is a really good thing. Uh, and they can collaborate in ways to build a system around the needs of a patient uh, and that we can set a, a target that represents value to a payer, both high quality and affordability and predictability, and live within our means as a healthcare delivery system. So, uh, so I understand that the capitation you stay where you need to be, but the quality aspects, I mean, in seeing that you have a slew of quality things that you had to reach for. And I understand, I know as a nurse, you're not going to reach those in 60 days or even a half a year. But over this year, with the same capitated lives you've had this last year, have you seen changes in the quality of what their own situation is? Yeah, I mean, we use the same quality measures by and large as we used during the shared savings period where it was what we call upside only sharing. If we save money, we get to keep some of it, uh, but not as much of it if our quality isn't good. Uh, and if we spent too much money, we didn't get anything and the quality really didn't matter, right? But we've been doing these quality measures for five years. So even under the weak incentives, 
for five years in all three programs, we increased our quality scores year to year every single time. I have not seen the results for last year because we're still in the period of collecting you know, retrospectively what those quality measures are. But, you know, one thing the ACO model has proven to be, even with weak financial incentives, is really, really good at measuring and improving quality, that the providers really rally around that. Um, uh, and I expect that to, I expect that to continue. And do we get a new quality, a set of quality indicator data at any time? I mean, there's, there are very specific ones that you had to work on. Yeah, the Green Mountain Care Board has published the quality outcomes for all programs on an, on an annual basis. It's usually about two-thirds of the way through the year because that's by the time you get the patient satisfaction scores all tallied for the previous year. And so there should be one out there from, I'm going to guess, maybe October of last year for 2016. There will be one September, October this year. Uh, for 2017. And certainly, you know, any of my clinical team would be glad to come in and talk to you about, you know, the, the multi-year quality improvement uh, uh, track record and probably give you a preview of, of what we're seeing from what measures we are able to measure uh, for last year already. I, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to come in and, and talk to you about that. I mean, I'm happy you're staying within the money, but I, it's really what's happening on the patient side that it's I'm a great, most interested in. Great point. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, glad to be here. Good to see everybody. And I believe we have Susan up next to tell us about. No, I'm sorry. Sure. 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 I'm sorry. Sure. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Same set of questions yeah. I have. Yeah. I, 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 I apologize. I was looking at the wrong sheet here. Um, okay. Yeah, so we have Susan up next. Hello, Susan. Hi, 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 Susan. Hi,
if the administrative burden in Vermont is already high and a deterrent for recruitment and retention, if you increase that, what uh, kind of unintended consequence would that have? Um, so to us, it's unclear what the value would be to incentivize clinicians to come if we're having a kind of commensurate increase in the administrative burden. Uh, the third point, and this was actually one made by Todd earlier, um, our members are experiencing what they call reform fatigue. They've been working for a long time. The Blueprint for Health was, what, 2007? So that's over a decade of kind of successive reforms and different efforts. Um, and so currently, they're all in on improving quality and lower, lowering cost trends. Um, but there's a worry that adding another layer of complexity to this already fatigued workforce, not to mention you know, the administrative staff who are basically volunteering their time to participate, could again result in some unintended consequences. Um, and then finally, the concerns are on behalf of our patients. Um, and I'll admit that this is a little bit of one of George's favorite things. I'm not sure all of you are aware, um, before I came to Vermont, when I worked in Boston, I was a consumer advocate for five years. Um, so the patient experience is near and dear to my heart. And the organization I worked for was engaged in a lot of outreach and education for patients. And we had a, a helpline for folks who encountered problems. Um, so if you add a new coverage benefit, um, it'll result in confusion just because it will result in confusion. Um, patients won't really understand what's covered and what's not covered. So we need to have significant outreach and education. Um, our members currently spend a lot of time assisting patients in navigating the current system. They would have to spend more time. Um, you know, and so one, one kind of scenario that I was thinking through was the current UPC benefit structure, um, and this is the one described in the 2016 report, doesn't cover medications or lab work. So Georgia, who's a diabetic, walks in with my universal primary care card. And my visit's covered, because that's one of the codes that's covered. But my lab test isn't covered, and my prescriptions aren't covered. Well, we hope that I still have my major medical plan and didn't drop it in my confusion. But what if I did? Or what if I went in and just had universal primary care because I'm like 28 and super healthy? I'm like, yeah, I don't need that. And then I uh, do some tear my ACL ski. This is what happens, right? Um, so you know, there's just a concern around confusion, significant medical debt, and just so making sure that whatever happens, we really have to have a significant amount of outreach and education, just so we don't end up with um, people in a worse place um, or getting those consequences. I think the. The final um, suggestion I would offer, and this um, relates to some of the concerns that I heard in earlier testimony about affordability, and I'm thinking back to that big hearing down in the House chamber that I, I believe you all um, were in attendance for. One of the issues raised was that individuals cannot afford the co-payment or the deductible for that primary care visit. So it was a real deterrent for folks even wanting to walk in the door, regardless of a sliding fee scale or whatever. Um, and so then individuals would wait until the situation was dire, then they would face significant health impacts, financial impacts, not the outcome we want. Um, so I would offer that it's actually possible that we have something slightly simpler and faster, which is just having first dollar coverage for all primary care services. So right now the Affordable Care Act has in place that there's first dollar coverage for preventive services. We as a state can make a decision to expand that to more than just preventive services. Um, and again, a company with outreach and education. <laughs> that could perhaps mitigate that deterrent factor on that doesn't require years of planning and complex operations. Um, and so I would just offer that as an additional way to, to deal with that particular challenge. And I know that some states are similarly finding other solutions to increase the primary care investment as a percent of premium and things like that just to, to try and have um, faster solutions, frankly, and other solutions that address the <coughs> concerns that they're facing. So with that, I will pause and answer any questions you may have. Um, I'm really curious about the last thing you were talking about, because mm -hmm. I was writing my question up, and I'm going to read what I wrote. Sure. Um, so I was, you know, you were, you, you were sort of making the argument it's going to make the system more confusing, but it also acknowledging that it's, all, it's already incredibly confu a confusing system. Um, and you know, ACO healthcare reform, it addresses the situation for payers, not the patients. And um, I was going to ask you, how do you propose we address 
the affordability and accessibility issues for patients to get primary care, and then you said this thing. <laughs> so I'm it's curious. Your if question, you, Representative. Yeah. So, but, but I mean, I think I would like to hear more details about what exactly you mean, because if, if this bill before us is not the best thing, if we can, can do anything in this session to to take a step in the right direction. I would like to do that. And so I'm curious if you could explain like what that means, first dollar coverage. I, I don't totally understand that, um, to be honest. Sure, so. I'm looking to see if it doesn't look like the insurers are in the room, so I can talk more freely. <laughs> <laughs> You're on tape, don't forget. They, they, they know I have this idea. <laughs> um, so the idea would be um, similar to how right now, if um, I go into um, my annual wellness checkup um, to my primary care clinician, I do not have to pay copay, despite right. the fact that my card says $20 office visit every time I go into a physician's office. That's because the Affordable Care Act says, thou shalt, insurance companies, not charge there. Um, we could similarly in Vermont say, all right, for Medicaid and commercial, we can't totally control Medicare, but maybe Todd could figure out a way to help work on the Medicare side. Um, to say, hey, for um, commercial carriers that are licensed in Vermont, which goes through DFR, thou shalt not charge. It would impact premiums to some extent. There'd be some you know, actuarial stuff that I will pretend I know how to do, what those smart people would do. Um, but it could be a way to get um, to make it so those services are paid for before the deductible gets triggered um, and an individual doesn't have you know a twenty dollar um, unpaid bill from a primary care visit that was you know just not affordable to them that month so can, can I just like I, mm -hmm. uh, just to ex expand this more put it to like for what would me be a, a real situation and then for people who don't aren't like steeped in healthcare policy it might be illustrated <laughs> so, like if I Get a tick bite. Not that that happened in the last year or anything. And I go to the doctor now under my like, I, like if I go for my physical in in two months or whatever it is, I don't have to pay anything for the physical. I did get a bill for the blood work. So you mentioned the lab stuff. I did get a bill for that, but the physical itself didn't cost anything. But then well, when I get, but they do charge for the physical if the preventive physical they actually find something, then they charge you for the. Oh, so I'm lucky that they didn't. Right. Okay, so thank you for illustrating that. But, okay. So I'm lucky that they didn't find anything. But, um, but, but, I, but they did good work in terms of, you know, having a nutritionist talk to me and things like that, right? So trying to do some of this population health work, that's great. But then when, if a tick bite happened to happen a few months later, and you went in, and then you get like a $90 bill, and all they did is kind of poke at it and say, take this antibiotic, you know? There's some people who may not go in for that tick bite if they know if they find out that it's going to cost them ninety dollars and then they get Lyme's disease and they get really really sick and then it costs them thousands and thousands of dollars or our system and the taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars. So it sounds like what you're saying is we have the power or we may have the power to tell insurance companies that they have to cover those basic primary care visits besides the physical for all diagnoses. But it might have a financial impact. It might make premiums go up. Is that what you were saying? Correct. Okay. okay. Yep. It would be, um, and I see your lawyer's not in the room, but I would liken it to a similar any mandate benefit that you implement um, in the private insurance market. Did you say that other states were looking at this? Um, so other and states so are looking at Is it successful and how, how many states? Um, so I don't believe any other state is doing this specific thing, although I, I, I don't take credit for coming up with the idea. Um, but um, the what a lot of other states are doing, and notably Rhode Island and Oregon have been doing it longer, so they have a little bit more data around their success, is that they are just, in general, increasing the amount, the percent of total healthcare expenditures that are spent on primary care. So rather than the seven, eight percent that we spend annually um, in Vermont, uh, Rhode Island is, I think, at 13 percent. Not as much as some other um, countries, but you know, definitely better than we're doing here. 
Um, and the results are that it does show some of those benefits you were asking about earlier in terms of um, <clears throat> reduced utilization of certain specialty services or avoiding uh, full-blown Lyme disease or Georgia going to the hospital with uh, you know, pneumonia or whatever it is based on a cold. So. I thought we had testimony last week, and I'm trying to find out who it was, that said we put $14 million more in primary care in Vermont this year, and I think it was in reference to That's one year's budget. And um, is that something <clears throat> such as that you're talking about, spending more money? It, it depends on how it's spent, I guess. I, I think that relates to the testimony we got from Rhode Island and then noting that we actually were already doing a lot of the things that Rhode Island said were, right. you know, they were doing right. I think it's in terms of that end of supporting primary care, which is not the same as the direct access end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and my understanding is that there's different uh, layers of investment. So one example is that the ACO could independently do some additional investment. Uh, Medicaid, I know, had some increased primary care investment this year, um, for, is in the governor's proposed. <coughs> in Rhode Island, it was through their commercial payers. The doctor assures me I'm fine. I went yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, no, I was reading. We, we had a fit. His budget actually cut payments to primary care. but that's, One bucket of payments, but then right. increased in another place. So it depends on who you are and where you sit. We ended up losing. Um, but but I think it's there's many ways to get at that increased investment. I guess is the point. This the particular one I was describing. Um, hopefully, we get more at the patient level, which I again I heard was one of the areas of concern mm -hmm. that was raised over and over. So I figured I'd throw the idea. Lord, not sure this question can be answered. So tell me that if, it's, if you can't. Um, you know, the FQHC model, in my mind, is, is exactly what we're trying to do. So for those people who are uninsured and are not going to an FQHC, do you know why? Is there ever been a study done, or do you have thoughts as um, to why we're not capturing everyone? So I have a little bit of a thought on, because in particular, actually, there are a lot of individuals in the Northeast Kingdom um, who are not accessing services. Um, just it's a very, compared to other parts of the state. Um, and one of the bits of analysis that that health center actually did is there's um, a desire by the individuals there to not take a handout. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very strong, well-seated one. Um, and you know, so there's uh, an effort, frankly, a newfound effort to say, okay, we'll get into the schools. So um, teaching, getting at someone when they're younger before some of those, um, so they can see that it's not necessarily a handout, that it's it's really part of the day-to-day -day life. Um, I, I, it's similar, I think, to some um, parts of the state where historically getting dental services was not what you did. Right. Um, and so, you know, we're continuing to fight on that front as well. So I think that there's a, a complexity for a certain subset of the population where it's just that is not something that they want to pursue. I do also um, believe, and I, you would have to talk to Blue Cross about this, um, but I believe that they've done some analysis around some of their um, beneficiaries who are not accessing services, and there's a chunk of younger, I want to say male, but again, please check with them, um, where it's just, it doesn't cross their their collective paths. Um, and I would note that as someone who has a spouse who's not quite as young a male as he once was still thinks he is, and so he also doesn't like to access medical services, so there could be something to that. Yeah, there is something to that. And there's no part of the state that QHC doesn't cover. So Correct. So um, I, I hear what you have to say, but I think that a piece of that is that when you come to people who don't access the care, sometimes it's that because of the dearth of primary care providers, that it's out eight months before you can even get an appointment, and they don't have a clue what they're going to be doing in eight months, so they don't make the appointment, then eight months comes, and they still don't have an appointment, and so it kind of like falls back and back. So it's a piece of the non no primary care providers to be gotten 
to see. And there's also, they tried the um, clinics for, yeah. the coalition for the uninsured that came and talked with us. They did have um, an uninsured clinic up there, but it failed, they couldn't make it work. And they have a huge representation that they take care of in the Middlebury area mm -hmm. and south of there. I can't remember where I'm down Rutland, maybe. I'm not sure, but I know Middlebury. And it seems to me that what they were talking about in Rhode Island, what they were just starting to do were the medical home model that we did years ago. And so we're ahead of them on that piece. Yeah. But I think they are ahead of us in what we funnel to primary care. And that, I think, would attract doctors here if we increase the amount. And that's kind of the question that I had for you, Mr. Moore, was about if we funnel more money towards the primary care, because coming down to the primary care, it kind of goes through the hospital entity. It's how I visualize it, coming down. Because instead of going up from the primary care into higher and higher treatment based on what your needs are, you're coming down from there, and that's that's why I'm... That's what the 14 million is. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, but it, it's just trying to make sure we are funding more to that primary care level than we are now, because it's very clear that we don't have enough at that level. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how we go about that. I, I sit we're doing it, we're doing it right now, that's what the 14 million is. And you're putting all 14 million into the primary care. Yeah. Right, so, so we don't have anything um, on our agenda now till four, we're finished up for oh. this piece. Um, but just a quick update, um, because um, I think, I'm not sure if everybody was here when Bill on Friday afternoon referenced what was going on with our mental health bill. So we pulled it off, back off the floor, back to committee, um, because originally what we thought might happen back over in the Senate, it turns out is maybe gelled enough for us to um, look at adding some language <coughs> explaining uh, the intention of what we hope is going to happen with um, some of the new ideas with um, psychiatric inpatient and secure residential. Um, and um, brand new, actually, I haven't heard the details yet, but brand new also, the whole interim um, what do we do in the interim before um, new facilities and before more community things help fill in? Um, I guess the Senate was looking pretty um, favorably towards the forensic unit in Swanton that we had kind of panned. Uh, and uh, AHS was working very hard on um, kind of the direction that we had supported. And it looks like they may have a proposal that may work out for an interim <laughs> Um, inter working with the Brattleboro Retreat for an interim facility. So um, at 4 o'clock, Al Bay is going to be in to present to us uh, about that, and we have some language from uh, Katie uh, to look at as far as what, um, what changes that would mean in terms of language in our bill and some thoughts on that. Um, because of where our bill was, it means some you know, there's always these fun little jurisdictional things, but it, the Senate was hearing about this. The Senate Institutions Committee, which has the Capitol Bill right now, was hearing about this um, earlier this afternoon. So they were hearing the information about um, the Brattleboro Retreat alternative to the forensic facility proposal. Um, and uh, they're testimony, testifying tomorrow in House Institutions. Um, but I spoke with the chair of House Institutions, you know, to keep all, all of the peace on those things, and she's fine with us um, hearing about it first, and her hearing about it, their committee hearing about it tomorrow. So that's what we're doing it for. Um, so, that's the update, and we'll see everybody then. Thank you. 